Okay, so let's discuss um, this central limit theorem. So theta naught's the true value of the parameter that you're trying to estimate. So, in particular, the variance of this thing, well, the variance of this thing then is approximately one. And so the variance of this thing is on the order of one over n, which means that uh, this, th this random variable, the variation from theta naught of the predictor, of the MLE estimator, uh, this, this has a small variance. That's, that's a good thing means the error isn't very big. Okay, so how do you um, do this? It's just Taylor's formula. So that's just uh, expanding a function L about the point theta naught. Its value at a nearby point theta hat will be its value at theta naught plus this difference times the derivative of the function we're approximating. So this is just Taylor's formula. We're interested in theta hat minus 
theta naught. So let's solve this for theta hat minus theta naught. And um, what's the, uh, well, yeah, I'm oh, sorry. What's the definition of theta hat? It's the point that maximizes this function. So what's the value of the derivative of L at theta hat? It's zero. Okay. Since theta hat's the MLE, it's the point where L of theta is a maximum. At the maximum, the derivative is zero. Okay. So Solving zero equal to this for theta hat minus theta naught gives theta hat minus theta naught is approximately equal to minus L prime of uh, theta naught over L double prime of theta naught. Okay, so what is the uh, Numerator here. It's summation I equal one to N derivative of the respect to theta log F of XI given theta not, and in the denominator we have sum i equal one to n second derivative. Okay, and um, there's a minus sign. All right. Now what we're going to do is following um, xi are independent random variables. So what you see here is a function of the xi. So for each, these, random, these are random variables and they're going to be independent, i going from one to n. So we have a sum of n independent random variables here. In fact, i id, independent identically distributed. Here we also have a sum of independent identically distributed random variables. What we're going to do is have the numerator try, try to get the numerator to converge to a constant and have the, I'm sorry, denominator. I do have vertical dyslexia. Okay. Right. right. So actually, I have no trouble with words like this. <laughs> or O. Or Did, things like that don't bother me because they're, they're the same up and down, right? So I, I mentioned this because I just said this was the numerator, but actually, <laughs> see, I confused top and bottom. Other dyslexics do back and forth. I'm, this is the denominator. <laughs> We're going to try to make this converge to a constant and have this converge to a normal random variable. But to do that, what do you have to do if you're adding up? IID random variables, what do you have to do to make it converge to a constant? Remember the law of large numbers? You have to divide by n, right? And in the numerator, if we want this to converge, use the central limit theorem here, we have to divide this by root n. So I'm going <coughs> to divide by square root of n here, divide by n here, and so I should do the same over here. 1 over root n and 1 over n here. And what's the net effect of multiplying the numerator by 1 over root n and the denominator by n? Yeah, so it would be multiplying this by root n. Okay.
Okay, so in the denominator, I'll put the minus sign in the denominator. One of n times the sum of iid random variables converges to the expected value of uh, any one of the summands, right? Remember the law of large numbers? <coughs> one over n sum i equal one to n yi converges to expected value of y. That's the law of large numbers. So this would converge to the expected value. Oh, and I'm sorry, there's a theta naught here. So this is, you differentiate and then evaluate it at theta equal theta naught afterwards, okay? This would converge to minus the expected value of the second derivative of the log likelihood function at theta naught. And we've given that a name. That's I of Theta naught. So the denominator with the minus sign included in the denominator converges to I of theta naught. The numerator, what, what do we have in the numerator? So if we have one over root n, uh, sum over i equal one to n yi. This would be approximately normal with mean uh, zero and variance expected value of y squared if expected value of y is zero. Where y is another copy of these guys, so maybe I could put y1 there. That's the central limit theorem. And I claim that the expected value of that sum end is zero. Uh, we did this last time. Um, So again, uh, by this I mean I differentiate in theta, then evaluate at theta, not afterwards. Um, do you remember you asked me why is something true? And I started by writing down integral of f of x given theta is a, dx is one, and it ended up with this thing being zero. Okay, so we did this computation, look at the notes at the end of the class on Monday. The expected value of the sum and is zero, and um, Last thing to check is the variance of that.
of the, of the, the expression in the numerator. Uh, what do we get? Um, The numerator is the sum of iid random variables with mean zero. And what happens when you take the variance of a uh, sum? Yeah, it's the sum of the variances. And why do we have a one over n here? Right, we factor this out. It becomes a one over n outside because the variance has things squared. And so we get the sum of the variances. Why are why is this a variance? Well, if the random variable has mean zero, then the variance is just a second moment. Right, because the variance is the second moment minus the mean squared. So with mean zero, it's, it's a variance. And this is I of theta naught. That's I of theta naught. If you don't believe me, let's go look over here. That's it. I of theta naught. And we have n terms that are all the same. So we, when we sum them, we get n times I of theta naught divided by that we get this. Okay. So what about uh, root n theta hat minus theta naught? Then uh, we know the we know that the bottom is going to a constant, and the numerator is approximately normal. So all we have to do and it has mean zero, so all I do is identify the variance of this thing, and <coughs> then we'll know what normal, what's the limiting variance. What's the variance of this then? Well, um, it's the variance of that, but what's the variance of the numerator? I zero, I, I of theta zero. Well, what's the denominator converging to? I of theta naught. So if you have a, we got some, like, this is like a normal random variable, z, with variance um, i of theta zero, and it's divided by i of theta zero. What's the variance of this? It's the variance of z over what? i squared of theta zero, right? And the variance of the numerator we just found was i of theta zero, so it's i of theta zero over i of theta zero squared. So that's one over i of theta zero. So the variance of this is about one over i of theta naught. Okay. The, this expression is just this ratio. The numerator has variance i of theta zero and the denominator is i, I of theta zero it's almost that constant by the law of large numbers. So the variance of the ratio would be the variance of the numerator divided by the denominator, which is nearly this constant. So it becomes squared, and we get i of theta naught over theta naught. So this thing has variance one over i of theta naught. That would imply the variance of root n i of theta naught times theta hat minus theta naught is approximately what number? One. Okay, so this is uh, approximately a normal random variable. It has mean zero and its variance is converging to one, so that's the central limit theorem. This thing is approximately normally distributed with mean zero and variance one for n large. Okay. So it's just a simple matter of expanding L, the like, log likelihood function at the MLE, realizing that the derivative of the log likelihood function at the MLE is zero. 
and then just got first order here, and you get this difference, which we're interested in. You solve for that difference, numerator, you apply law of large, uh, central limit theorem, denominator, law of large numbers. And that's it. That's all there is to it. Okay, so let's use this. This is useful in finding confidence intervals when you don't know the distribution of theta hat. Sometimes you know the distribution of theta hat. For example, when you have a normal, just when you have a, the xi's are normal, maybe with some unknown theta and some known sigma squared. Theta hat we found was the sum i equal 1 to n xi. This is known uh, to be what? Normal with mean theta invariance sigma squared over n, right? So we can. Uh, use this, that we, that we know the distribution of this to find confidence intervals for theta, okay? So theta hat minus theta would be normal with mean zero invariant sigma squared over n. And that will help us find confidence intervals for theta. See, we know the distribution, we can work with it here. You don't always know the distribution of this, and sometimes even if you kind of know it, it's difficult to work with. So let's do one example. Um, this was an exercise, actually, uh, geometric random variables. Let's take geometric random variables where you don't know P. So what would be an example of this? Um, I know, maybe you played basketball before. You go out to the court, take your ball along, and you go to the free throw line and you shoot until you make a basket. That's x1. And then you do it again, shoot until you make a basket. Count from the number of trials after the first one that it takes to get a second success. Do this n times. Do you know your probability of success in uh, making free throws? Do you know it exactly? No. So you want to estimate it. Okay. Well, of course you want to do this, right? This is what you think about all the time. So you want to, you want to find a, a P hat. Or you might be in your room studying at night and the garbage can is in the corner and every time you crumple up a piece of paper that you ruined, you shoot it towards the basket. Some go in, some go out. Don't. Don't. Okay, so we want to estimate p. So of course we take the log likelihood function and try to find the uh, MLE. So what's the uh, distribution given p? It's uh, 1 minus p to the x minus 1 times p. And so the <laughs> log 
log likelihood function could be written this way using the property of logs that the log of a product of two numbers is the sum of the logs. And then uh, if you have a log of a something to a power, the power comes out. Well, this is supposed to be capital XI here, sorry. So we get the sum here, I equal one to N, uh, capital XI minus one times logarithm, one minus P, and then plus uh, adding the log of P, N times gives N log of P. Okay. And now let's uh, simplify that a bit. Okay, so in the first one, there's a, with the XIs, uh, with the XIs, there's a uh, sum of the XIs, and there's this factor here that's the same for every I, so I pull that out, and then I add these up. And if I add up the XIs, that gives me N times X bar, right? So I'd get N X bar logarithm one minus P for the first term. And then I have minus one times log one minus p. And I add that up n times, so I get minus n times log one minus p. And here I have plus n times log p. And do you remember what's log of a minus log of b, how that behaves? Excellent. Okay, so that would be plus n times uh, well, you know, I'm going to differentiate it. So I actually, maybe I won't do that combination until later. Okay, and let me factor out the n then at the end. So that's our log likelihood function given the data, x1 through capital XN. Let's differentiate. I think you get this when you differentiate. Uh, derivative of log is one over whatever appears inside, right? So we get one over one minus p, but then we have to differentiate one minus p, and the derivative of that is minus one, so we get a minus sign here. This has derivative one over p. This would have minus one over one minus p, but there's a minus sign, so it becomes plus. We want to set this equal to zero. So we get um, x bar minus one over one minus p is equal to one over p. Yeah. X bar minus one is one minus p over p, x bar is equal to one plus one minus p over p, but now we combine this by finding a common denominator which is p, so this is p over p. p plus one minus p is one. So x bar is one over p, so what's the p hat? One over x bar, okay. Now in principle, uh, you know the distribution of this. This is n over the sum x1 plus dot 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 plus xn. These are geometric, so that would be a negative binomial. 
but even trying to compute the expected value of this is difficult. So even though it's known, it's hard to work with. So if we want to find a confidence interval for p hat, uh, it would be difficult to do it using this, but uh, it's not so bad using that. So let's use that. So what we have to do is compute i for this distribution. Now i of p in this case is minus the expected value, second derivative with respect to the parameter of log of f of x given p. Okay, now we already, uh, hmm. kind of computed it. Uh, this is the derivative of what? Log of f of xi given p. So this is the first derivative here with xi, this, just this term. Okay, no? Pardon? Without the sum. Pardon? Oh, I didn't differentiate yet, I'm sorry. Where did I differentiate? I thought I differentiated there. Oh, okay, uh, here. This would be it with an x there. Sorry, yeah. Just put x here and that's the derivative. Yeah, I, I didn't look at what I was pointing at. <laughs> it's still not the derivative? Here it is, this is it. <laughs> here it is, this is it. <laughs> I knew it was somewhere. <laughs> With x here, okay, finally, okay. So uh, I had to differentiate that. Okay, so uh, there's a minus sign here, and I have to take the derivative with respect to p of minus x over one minus p plus one over p plus one over one minus p. Okay, this is, this is the first derivative, we have to take second. And now, derivative of this with respect to p would give me, uh, let's see, um, a minus because of the, it's to the minus one, another minus because there's a minus p, and then this minus, so that's three minuses, so it'd be minus x over one minus p squared. Derivative here would just, oh, not, it's not x bar, it's x here. This is just one, one random variable, okay. In the i, it's just at one random variable. Okay. Yeah, yeah and because we're only doing one, yeah, so no n. So the, the, the reason there's n here is because we added up n of the n terms like that. Okay. Then minus one over p squared. And then plus one over one minus p squared. Because here, uh, this is one minus p to the minus one, a minus one comes down, and then we get another minus one from differentiating that. All right, so I think we can evaluate this now. Um, minus, minus gives me a plus. What's expected value of x? If x is geometric with parameter p, it's one over, one over p. So the first term is one over p times one minus p squared. And then this is, is a constant, so that's one over p squared. And then I get minus one over one minus p squared. And uh, I think that can be simplified. Common denominator is uh, p squared, one minus p squared.
in the numerator we get a p plus a 1 minus p squared and then a minus p squared. and this cancel, so you get 1 minus p over p squared times 1 minus p squared, which would be 1 over p squared times 1 minus p. That's i of t. Okay. All right, so what does that up there say? Okay, so a uh, Now this is approximately equal to 1 minus alpha because this is only approximately a normal random variable, which means zero invariance one, where you know by now what this z means. Solving that for uh, p hat, we get that uh, p minus I'm sorry, p hat minus p squared 1 minus p over n square root times z of alpha over 2 to p hat plus square root p squared 1 minus p over n z of alpha over 2 is an approximate One hundred one minus alpha percent confidence interval for the true value p, but there's a flaw in this. Yeah, the endpoints depend on p. So what do we do? Well, let's use p hat. Yeah. <laughs> so. We can't use p in the endpoints because we don't know what it is. So. So we use p hat. And uh, that's justified because the error is uh, small with large sample. Okay. okay, so that's how you use this theorem for uh, con constructing confidence intervals. Okay. You um, <coughs> use the central limit theorem here, but uh, at the end, you can't use theta naught, you have to use theta hat in the i. Okay, so let's do something uh, now for something completely different. What's that from? There's a Monty Python. You ever watch that? Do you know what that is? They'd always say, now for something completely different. <laughs> okay, here's a quiz for you. What was the first word always in the show, Monty Python? 
It's, <laughs> you don't remember that either. Because <laughs> okay. it's too old. Anyway, um, my kids like Monty Python a lot. I don't know if they ever seen it. Pardon? My kids were influenced by them? Maybe. By, <laughs> by me, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I guess so, yeah. Okay, so uh, suppose uh, uh, you're given a bag of, of a coin, maybe. It has heads and tails. What is the probability? Theta that the coin will turn up tails. Heads. Well, it's a new coin. You've never seen it before. Uh, it's a bit peculiar. It has a, a strange face on the front and some building on the back. And uh, you don't know what the, what the theta is. So here's what some sophisticated statisticians called Bayesians would do. Assume that theta is a random variable. And we Yeah, I, using a new word. How many of my oldest son studied for SATs, so I quiz him on uh, vocabulary every night. So you might notice I'm getting some new words. This also helps fight senescence. <laughs> you know what that means? It's uh, the effects of aging. <laughs> Positive initial guess for the... the uh, I, we assume theta is distributed according to, it has some density. F sub capital theta. This is called the prior distribution. The idea is to view some data and update our opinion about the distribution of theta. This new distribution will be called the posterior. So what does it mean to get data here? It means you toss a coin a bunch of times and record how many heads there are, how many tails.
So um, usually uh, you don't want to assume too much about the prior. You want to maybe keep an open mind about things. Uh, so theta is supposed to be a random variable, and it's a probability of something happen, happening. So capital theta there is should be a random variable takes values between 0 and 1. So yeah, so uniform 0, 1 doesn't um, impose much of a, a restriction on it, right? Doesn't, if you, you might assume, you might have thought that theta should be concentrated near half or something like that. But before you've tossed a coin, you don't want to you know, make any prejudicial judgment like that. So one good uh, guess here is, or one good uh, approach would be to take uniform distribution. Then um, the density for x given theta, where x is the outcome of a coin toss. So how do we encode outcomes of coin tosses? We let capital X be 1 if the coin come up heads and 0 if it comes up tails, or in other words, it's going to be a Bernoulli random variable with probably of success theta. And one way to write this is um, This way. All right. What happens here if x is 1? It's theta, which is right. What happens here if x is 0? Yeah, this is 0, this is 1, so you get 1 minus theta. Okay. I write it this way because we want to differentiate in theta, probably, to get MLEs. But Let's write down now the joint distribution of capital X and capital theta. But this is 1, so this is just OK. What we're interested in is this thing, the posterior. That is, the distribution of our random variable that represents the probability of success given some data. Okay. So let's um, think now we want to toss this coin more than once. We're going to toss it n times, right? So what we're going to observe
Okay. So what would the um, distribution of y be given theta? Yeah. So all we do is ramp this up so that we have n observations. Well, this would mean you have this many successes. And this is a probability of success. So you get this for the distribution of y, given you know theta. And what would the joint density then be for y and theta? So just as before, you get this, and this is 1. So it's just n choose y, um, theta to the y, 1 minus theta to the n minus y. And this is for 0 less than theta less than 1. Okay. So what's the distribution of uh, y? What's the marginal for y? Right. You integrate the joint with respect to theta. So that would be from 0 to 1. OK? So this would be n choose y, integral 0 to 1, theta to the y, 1 minus theta to the n minus y, d theta. And you may or may not recall the beta density. This is called the beta density. Uh, this is for 0 less than u less than 1. In other words, um, in particular, if we integrate this from 0 to 1, we get 1. That means the integral of this from 0 to 1 is the inverse of this constant. Okay? That's what we have here. We're integrating the meat part, that's, I, I learned this from a statistician a long time ago, the stuff without the, and the density without the constants, you call that the meat part of the, but I'm kind of a vegetarian, so I don't know. The, the vegetable patty part of this <laughs> density is here. So we just have to figure out what A and B are and invert this thing. Okay, what's A? It would be y plus, y plus 1, and B would be N minus Y plus 1, right? I've exhausted all of my uh, So A is Y plus one, B is n minus y plus 1. This should be a minus 1. This should be b minus 1, right? So we get gamma of a, that would be gamma of y plus 1, times gamma of b, that would be n minus y plus 1, over gamma of a plus b. which would be n plus 2.
And now these are integers, y and n, and 1 and 2. So these will be factorials. The n choose y is n factorial over y factorial, n minus y factorial. This is y factorial. This is n minus y factorial. This is n plus 1 factorial. And this looks like 1 over n plus 1. And uh, this is for y equal to what values? 0, 1, 2, up to n. So there are n plus 1 possibilities for y. That's the number of heads in n tosses of a coin. The marginal distribution of y given or when we integrate out the uniform distribution of theta is that. It's uniform. Okay, so what are we interested in? The thing I erased says we're interested in not this but the other the conditional distribution of theta given x or given y in our case. Posterior distribution of theta given the observation y is well, this is the joint. distribution over the joint density over the density of y, right? Which we've just computed. Well, this is 1 over n plus 1, so we get an n plus 1 in the numerator. And then what was this? which I believe is uh, uh, let's see a y plus 1 is this. Here y is fixed. Now did I do this correctly? Well, hmm? what do I have confidence in? This is a density in theta, right? That means when I integrate this, I have to get 1. So what constant do I have to put in front of this in order to get 1 as the integral? Well, this is the vegetable patty part of the beta density, right? So what's the A, what's the B? A is just like over there, y plus 1. B is n minus y plus 1. So this has to be the right constant. So in other words, I know with a fair amount of confidence that if I checked this thing would have to be this thing because that's the only way you get this to integrate to 1. So what's the posterior distribution of theta given y? It's a beta distribution. So the probability of heads given an observation of y successes in n tosses would be a beta distribution with <coughs> parameters a equal y plus 1, b equal n minus y plus 1. 
So we started with sort of a flat, unbiased assumption about the distribution of the probability of heads. It's a, we treat it as a random variable. We posed a hypothesis that maybe it's, let's try a uniform distribution because we have no idea about where this theta might be. We want to take a prejudice point of view. And then <coughs> we observed some data. We tossed a coin n times. We saw that many heads. And then we ask, what's your opinion about the distribution of theta now? And we found that uh, using this conditional definition of conditional probability, the, dist the density for theta, given the observation y, was a beta density. Okay. And this is called the posterior distribution. Let's do one more example of this. So let's try Poisson. We have no idea what the parameter is in a certain phenomena that has Poisson distribution. For example, like the number of customers that come into 7-Eleven on a street corner in Hong Kong between 11 and midnight at some random variable. And so in the previous one, and as it all, we assume some initial distribution for lambda. And now in this case, um, it turns out to be uh, mathematically convenient, and that uh, doesn't mean that it's necessarily good, but it works uh, to assume. that the density, the prior density, is a gamma distribution. Okay. And the point should be made that these uh, prior densities should be selected before any data is viewed. Okay. The reason for this is mathematical. It gives a very nice answer. So we'll assume that the distribution of lambda is uh, gamma. Okay. Now usually we have <coughs> x here and a lambda to the alpha, but I, I can't use Lambda is a parameter in a gamma because I'm using it as a parameter in the Poisson. So I got to switch the parameter for the gamma distribution to use the letter nu instead of lambda. Lambda is already taken. So we assume. X is Poisson with parameter capital lambda, i.e., the conditional density of capital X given lambda is uh, lambda to the X over X factorial e to the minus lambda, X equal 0, 1, 2, etc. Okay? Now we observe. IID copies and let's call this our let's call that a random vector x
and then we have the conditional density of observing little x1, little x2 through little xn, given that the parameter value is lambda, would be this. They are independent, so it would be the product of these individual ones, where I put xi in here. When I take the product of these with xi here and here, we get this. Okay. So the joint distribution of the vector x and the random variable lambda is the conditional times the marginal distribution for lambda. Okay. And the marginal distribution for x would be integrate this with respect to lambda. And lambda is a gamma random variable, so the integral goes from zero to infinity. Okay, so in particular, there's no lambda here, right? Uh, lambda is integrated out. So I'm not going to do this, if that's okay with you. Let's just say it's a, it's something we can integrate. But what are we always interested in? The other way, if we observe this vector of outcomes. What is that? Well, that's the joint distribution over the marginal for x. Which if we had energy, we could do. Okay, but what's the uh, what's the joint here? I have to multiply this times this thing. So let's do that. Um, and I'm only going to be interested in the part that involves lambda. Okay, in particular, this part doesn't involve lambda. So I'm only going to write down the parts that involve lambda first. And that, that's this one here, right? We get a lambda to the what? I'm not even write it as a fraction. I get lambda to the sum from 1 to n of xi. That's from this part, right, here. And what do I get here? Is there a lambda here? Well, there's a couple places. There's a, a lambda to the alpha minus 1. So when I multiply the lambda to this power times the lambda to the alpha minus 1, I get this. And then I get an exponential part. I get an e to the minus n lambda from here. And what about here? Here I get an e to the minus nu lambda. So I'd be e to the minus n plus nu lambda, and then uh, everything else I'll write as a constant because it doesn't depend on lambda.
And if I did the integration, and kept track of all the constants, here's what I get, that C is equal to that. Now how was I able to write that down so quickly? Did I do that computation in my head? Well, you don't know for sure. <laughs> but this is what? This is a density, yeah, gamma density, right? And we know what constant has to go out in front of a gamma density to make it integrate to one. It's this number to the alpha, the new alpha is that, over gamma of this number. So the posterior distribution of lambda is a gamma again. We started with gamma, filtered it through the exponential, I mean the Poisson, and we got a gamma in the end. Yeah? So you're saying that we didn't have to integrate the... Yeah, that's why I didn't do this. Since none of that's going to depend on lambda. Yeah, it won't depend on lambda. This part didn't depend on lambda. Uh, then, then there were these constants here, this constant here, and if I were to, you know, put them all in and then shake it up, it would come out to be that. But I didn't have to do that because I know it's going to be a density. Okay, so um, what's the new, um, <coughs> this is the old alpha. The new alpha is going to depend more heavily on this thing, right? Here's the old uh, parameter nu. The new one is n plus nu. So the alpha and the nu, if they're taken to be small, sort of get lost. Okay, this, this data and the sample size become more important than the, so if we take alpha and nu small, uh, if you look at the graph of the gamma density for alpha and nu small, it's very flat. It's almost, it's uh, kind of like picking a uniform distribution on the interval from zero to infinity, but you can't really do that. But it's, if alpha and nu are small, it looks a bit like that. Um, so that's the, and that's the reason why you would take, uh, the prior density be gamma because the posterior density comes out to be gamma. Okay, it worked out very nicely. There's some other cases like that where you start with some posterior density of some form, I'm sorry, prior density of some form, and then the posterior density has the same form, just the parameters are changed. Okay, so this is called the Bayes Bayesian approach to uh, parameter estimation. We'll do more of this Friday.